back to Not So Obvious Watches. I'm Pete McConville. They say never apologise to your audience too much when you're speaking, but I'm going to here. I apologise for my voice. I've had a terrible cold for about a week. It's not going anywhere. I have to put out more content, so you're kind of stuck with me. If this is too much of a put-off, I'm terribly sorry. Just move on to another video okay so um first things first this is going to be part two of my predictions for uh, for 2020 what i'm going to do is address some of the issues some of the comments some of the questions that came up in response to part one we'll start with rolex a number of you said that there's likely to be a new explorer as well as a new submariner this year i'm on board with that uh rolex is going to want to get rid of its 31 series movements 3100 series movements as quickly as they can and replace them with 32 200 series movements if they can do that um, they will so if they can put a new uh, a new explorer out this year and they've got that capacity they will do so when we come to tudor a number of you um, <coughs> have, have even offered to place substantial bets that tudor will not be allowed to have a submariner i certainly see the logic rolex group may seem to may like to separate their rolex brand from their tudor brand um on the other hand and that would make sense and 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 that's very logical on the other hand the rolex group has been happy to have those two brands play sort of off each other and i i will bring you back to what they did with the gmt where they released two gmts on top of each other i think to actually amp up the talk I think they were quite happy for the fact that there might have been some cross cannibalization because across the board it ended up being better for both brands there could be some fairly sophisticated analysis going on inside the rolex group saying we actually get more value from having a broader spread of submariner talk even if it's across two of our brands so i still think it's a 50 50 chance that we will see a tudor uh submariner that said for all of you who offered bets i don't bet on anything that can speak so i'm not going to place a bet on anything that involves humans therefore sorry i'm not taking up any bets on this um another thing i will look at though is i would if uh, particularly remembering the way those two brands rolex and, and tudor within that group play off against each other would not be at all surprised to see if there is a new rolex explorer there's a very good chance of there being an update of the new of the sorry 2014 ish uh tudor heritage ranger tudor may take the opportunity to again update its kind of explorer ish equivalent at the same time that rolex does and at the same time that rolex is putting in its new movement tudor could take the opportunity to put its new mt movements into the the heritage ranger to replace the eta i could see that occurring this year as well some of you ask questions about alpina uh because they are something of a favorite brand of mine and i skipped over them oh uh, yeah and the first question someone asked was have i gone off alpina since they were bought by frederick constant and then taken up by citizen absolutely not would i have preferred that alpina had remained uh independent of course would however that was never going to happen they were dead uh, they were they were basically dead buried and gone uh there was no alpina company for about two years until frederick constant bought them so um Frederick Constant has brought them back into life, has treated them with, I think, a fair bit of respect, has treated them very well, um, and has, after a little while, found a, a nice place for Alpina. But likewise, I would say I've seen no evidence that Citizen has used them as cash cows or, or anything. Citizen has, again, treated those two brands very well. So, no, that doesn't faze me at all. What I would say, though, is that tracking smaller brands like Alpina is very difficult. They don't have great big full ranges with decades of this kind of repeatable pattern or rhythm which makes it possible to sort of get some idea of what's happening with an Omega or a, or a, a Rolex it's a bit patchier but having said that uh, I won't squib it I'll have a go at making a recommendation what I would say is that I think their quartz lineup is pretty terrible and if you do go look at their website for things like quartz star timers a lot of them are out of stock 
but there's an awful lot of them turning up at like Joma shop and second and grade de- second hand and grade dealers. My theory is I think we're going to see. Last year we saw a new Alpina Alpina quartz, which is very nice, very classy looking. I think we're going to see something similar in the Star Timer range this year. I also think that Alpina is going to double down on its um, smartwatch technology. Uh, The Alpina X has, by all reports, been an amazing success for them. I think we're going to see them continue down that path. Um, So my prediction number two is I think things like they've got a a horological smartwatch, which is kind of their older generation, that, that when they were first experimenting with it, I think that'll probably get killed fairly shortly and to follow on from the alpina x i think we might see a um, star timer x and a c strong x following the new mtm uh, movement architecture a number of you responded to my comments about Seiko Pulsar saying that Seiko had put some things that that's Pulsar had put out like some 50th uh, anniversary editions and so forth. I'm not talking about the odd edition here or there. What I was not really predicting but suggesting to Seiko is that they step right back from Pulsar, take a leaf out of, say, the Timex or, um, or Casio book, relaunch that brand completely with an idea of making it a serious watch brand which serious watch collectors buy in the same way that casio has done so that if someone stands up and you know does a youtube channel and says you know a great budget first first watch to get your kid into watches is a casio fw19 is it no fw91 wouldn't it be good if they could say fw91 or pulsar xxyy whatever that worked out to be Coming up onto Breitling, there was really two points that came out of that. Firstly, it's widely under, widely believed that there is no way Tudor is going to help out a competitor by giving them access to their second movement. I actually kind of agree with that. I, I think Breitling would love to get it. Whether Tudor would want to make it available is a completely different kettle of fish. My only... The reason why I think it could be viable, a number of you said, well, clearly they've done a movement swap and, you know, and, and, and Breitling have given their movement, so they've got nothing else to give. I think, I've no evidence for this, but I think that Breitling gave more than access to their chronometer, their chronograph movement. What my, my takeaway here is the price differential, the price increase going from the ETA movements to the in-house tutor movements has been very small. That movement has been very cheap, surprisingly cheap. Almost everyone has remarked on how inexpensive it was. Um, I suspect that one of the reasons why that uh, movement was so cheap is because Breitling also chipped in some cash for the development of that movement. So the NRE was spread across a larger, a large, essentially two brands. I would note that the price differential between the ETA and the newer, smaller uh, tuna movement is of the same order. It is still a remarkably cheap in-house movement. That leads me to think it is possible that Breitling also chipped in some collab cash for that, reducing the NRE, making it um, a cheaper watch altogether. I don't know that. It's just me sort of trying to read the tea leaves and guess what might have happened. Uh, Time will tell whether I'm right or wrong. Still on Breitling, some of you asked me about the professional series. Uh, George Kern has been winding that back. If you watch really carefully and take screenshots here and there, which I have not been doing, you would notice that there's actually a lot less uh, watches in the professional range than there used to be. I think that will continue for a little while. I think he wants to, in fact, he has said he wants to trim that line down. Um, I think that will continue to occur. I don't think we'll see any new professional watches for a little while. Okay, so that's sort of my recap on my my part one. That was looking more at brands. This is now going to be looking at industry-wide stuff. Prediction number one isn't really that outlandish. We're going to see an increase in growth in what I call the watch lifestyle media and a corresponding fall away in what you might call watch journalism. So watch lifestyle media like Hadinki, Revolution, Fratello, those guys, they will continue to grow and grow and grow and increasingly crowd out actual watch journalists. That's going to have 
that's really not going to have anything any new effects we've been seeing this already what it means is increasing uh, media attention on a decreasing pool of watches as those lifestyle brands like like any other sort of brand that makes its money by views will really focus on those brands which will generate traffic back so if you are rolex if you are omega if you are grand seiko um and you generate traffic for hadinki you will get a lot of coverage on hadinki if you are a smaller brand that isn't particularly well known then you are going to suffer because not only will you not get much coverage they're not into advertising that much so you probably can't even buy your way onto them and yeah you're going to have to find a new way but i will talk about that later in another prediction okay so prediction number two all is not lost with the takeover of uh, the watch media by lifestyle as opposed to journalistic channels because my prediction here is that we are going to see a return of the enthusiast blog to fill in that gap uh, talking about watch brands and talking about um, uh, watch issues that necessarily drive traffic to the big brands like Hadinki Revolution Fratello that need to make money. So if you look at uh, something like the Scottish Watches website, which has, I think, seen an explosion in content, I think what you see is out there a real desire from enthusiasts to have their say, to talk about things which they're not seeing spoken about. That's why my channel exists. Uh, and you've got a th enough thirst, enough desire not to fuel a full paid media empire, but certainly to provide the provide impetus for small channels, small personal blogs to keep rolling. I think you are going to see those sorts of blogs like Scottish Watches, like XJS, like these things which are run by more individuals with little, with smaller revenue streams. I think we're going to see them expand enormously um, into the space that's left over by the retreat of the professional watch journalist media. Okay, so prediction number three, again, not a particularly big prediction to start with. That is, the watch industry will continue to grow and that that growth will be focused more at the higher end, so watches measured in the thousands rather than watches mentioned uh, measured in the hundreds of dollars. Uh, a slightly more interesting part of that prediction, I think that the watch industry will realize it's largely tapped out a lot of its traditional markets. So in there, it's about surviving. They're going to be looking increasingly at places where they can make new sales to people that aren't currently buying watches and that's going to be predominantly cover gender so they're going to aim more at genderless slash female watches it's going to be on geography i think watches watch companies are going to pay more and more attention to india more and more attention to uh, south america and more attention to the middle east and finally the, the the permanent serious watch industry is going to start focusing an, on an area that they have abandoned which is the fashion conscious fashion forward western consumer the serious watch industry is going to start looking at those sales being made by movado by movement and by daniel wellington etc and want them back and i think you're going to see some really aggressive steps into that space from what we would have called the traditional or serious watchmaker okay so prediction number four um, and this one concerns micro brands and there's three sub predictions if you like in there so prediction number one or prediction number 4.1 if you want to think of it that way is that we will see a slowing down of new entrance into the low end of the micro brand uh, industry so the you know, two three four five hundred dollar watches um, from english speaking countries so those brands a new brand that suddenly pops up in australia england ireland wherever and has to compete with the established players like Notice or Halios or whatever, they're going to really struggle because they have to compete with those people. So I think they will still come up. There will be new brands that we've not heard of before, but there will not be um, the kind of growth that we've seen of companies in that space 
in 2020 or beyond. Okay, so prediction 4.2. We will, however, see a number of new brands coming into that space, the 200, 300, maybe up to about $1,000 space. But these will be brands which have already cut their teeth in non-English speaking markets. These will be brands that have come out of France or Germany or Italy or wherever, have had a couple of series of watches behind them, will appear new to us, but will have actually been around for a couple of years and have got all of their stuff sorted, have got their inventory management and their marketing and their websites and their distribution, their QC. They've got all that done, but they did it out of our eye shot they're going to become into our eye shot and we're going to see i think in 2020 and beyond we're going to start noticing more and more of these brands coming out of places like france and italy etc okay so prediction 4.3 is that one of the things that we will see though is more micro brands either moving up to or even starting in that more than a thousand us dollar range more like the mings and the Farahs and the montas i think that um, what you're going to see is small brands might not even want to call them micro brands but we'll we'll stick with micro brands which are much more heavily capitalized than we're used to much more um much more business-like that we're used to and will come in at, at a fairly high dollar value with very high level very high very sophisticated watches um i think we'll see more and more of that as if you like serious money starts to see what can be done in this space and it's less and less you know a couple of school teachers doing it over their summer break which is what we did in the past Okay, so moving on. Now, in exactly the same way as all of us buy car magazines that talk about hypercars we can never afford, most of us like reading stories about watches, hyper watches that we can never afford. So even though someone like F.P. Jean or Morris Grossman or Grubel Forzi sells very few watches, we all love reading about it. So they've been getting lots of coverage in the watch lifestyle media and they will continue to do so. However, my prediction and prediction number five is that that group will in 2020 or if not this year very soon will start to be joined by very high level artisanal quality independent manufacturers from asia i don't know if it's going to be some timeless craftsman coming out of japan i don't know if it's going to be someone leveraging the massive industry that's growing in china and jumping off the the increasingly uh, patriotic back uh, communities we're seeing there i don't know if it's going to be someone leveraging um the new korean cool and coming up with something out of korea which would be really interesting or as ming has shown taking on that whole entrepreneurial spirit and that ability to to synthesize across multiple nations that's coming out of places like singapore and across southeast asia i don't know what the answer will be but if i just look at what's happening with the community's desire to look at these hyper watches and the community's desire to find something new and interesting from a place we haven't seen it before i would say now is the time for one or more of these high-end independents from Asia to step up into the limelight and become a name like F.P. Jean. Mark my words, if it doesn't happen this year, it'll happen in the next year or two. Okay, so prediction six. All my other predictions have been kind of positive and spoken about growth and new things happening. Prediction six is that um, some brands that some people love and cherish will if not die, become kind of zombie-like in 2020 and beyond. Ariel Adams spoke in his Dubai Watch Week uh, wind-up that there is a general feeling in the community that there are too many brands, there's excess capacity, um, too much inventory being left over. If you look at what happens with Joma Shop and these sorts of places, there is obviously a lot of excess industri industry going around, inventory going around. Um, yes someone's gonna die i don't know who it is but i can tell you what their characteristics are the characteristic of the watch that's going to the watch company that's going to die in 2020 is that it does not harness the new reality of 
it can't buy coverage. You have to be creative in the social media to make your own coverage. You have to be like Zodiac. You have to be like Timex. You have to create your own buzz, which you cannot simply buy. You have to be clever and smart and adaptive and interactive. And you've got to force yourself into the consciousness. And then when you have become a traffic generator, the new lifestyle media will pick you up and run with you. So some brands will work that out. I don't know who they are. Some brands won't, and I don't know who they are. But we will see less brands with updated websites and new product than ever before through this year because some brands will simply start running out of money. Okay, so prediction number seven is a prediction I'm going to make about what we're going to see, which comes out of two of my earlier predictions. So I've already predicted that the watch industry is going to start chasing um, new markets, and in particular in the West, it's going to chase those people who are currently buying fashion watches. And I've also predicted that some companies are going to go bust unless they find new markets, unless they find new ways of marketing. An outcome of that is my prediction number seven, and that is that we are going to see the line between fashion and serious brands erode, if not dissolve completely. In my estimation, by almost any measure, Timex is a fashion brand. The Timex Q is not immensely popular because it comes from um, some old historic place. The Timex Q is immensely popular because it's feeding off the same dynamics, the same ideas, the same feelings of fashion that a Daniel Wellington, that a movement, that a Movado does. It markets the same way. It presents the same way. It just has an advantage in our community of being wedded to an old Timex brand. But that's not why anyone not in our community is buying those time excuse they're buying them because they're fashionable other brands are going to work that out other companies are going to work that out other companies are going to start serious watch companies are going to start dissolving those bounds between themselves and the fashion company the fashion brands and their watches are going to become their marketing and their sales are going to become increasingly fashion oriented Likewise, there's going to be some smart fashion brands out there who realize if we tweak our marketing, if we tweak our approach, we may be able to now move into the enthusiast market. We may be able to produce watches which actually carry a bit of heft in that market as well. So I expect to see some movement backwards and forwards. There are some brands that cannot make that transition. Daniel Wellington Movement, Movado, Vincero, they've burnt their bridge. They're not making that transition back into the serious watch market but some of them might. So that's it. My voice is about to give out completely. So I'm going to wrap this up. I've been Pete McConville. This has been Not So Obvious Watches. If you've got any comments, if you disagree, agree with me, stick them in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. Uh, if you wait a little while, the card's going to come up with all my contact details and my Instagram. Go give me a follow over there. Um, please, if you like this video, give it a big thumbs up. If you didn't like it, feel free to give it a dislike, but let me know why, because I like to try and I like to know where I'm not hitting the mark, even if I don't change. Um, and yeah, please, one last thing, subscribe to the channel. If you could, please hit the bell icon and even better, you know, go into your YouTube settings and say that you do want to get notifications. That helps me out enormously. One, if you see my videos, that does better for the channel. And two, if I have subscribers, that makes it easier for me to talk to brands and other people because it gives this channel some weight. So all in all, that would be great if you could do that, please. Thanks very much, and I'll see you later. Bye.